had to come on and just capture this moment because I'm going to tell you with this topic that I wanted to share with you today, and I'm going to share with you today. I have been incredibly anxious, nervous, excited. All the feelings have been happening for me as I've been putting the content together for today's video, which is going to be sharing the 17 years of my salary history and the roles that I've had in tech. And I didn't think I would be feeling this way, to be honest. I, I just thought I was going to come on and I was going to share this and be super excited because, you know, I don't know. That's just what I believed. <laughs> but the reality is, is I've been sitting here with this spreadsheet and this information and trying to put words to the story for the last day and a half and I'm a little stuck. But that means that I'm doing something that is worth it and I hope you find meaningful today. The more that we can have open and honest conversations not only about how to build wealth and invest, but also share our salary in a way that is helpful to others to understand what is possible, what is out there to reduce the gender wage gap, to create more equality in the workplace when it comes to pay is really important. And as a woman of color, I know what it feels like to feel like you can't talk to anybody about this. And so I hope you enjoyed today's video. I wanted to share this personal reflection. And now that I've done this and gotten it off my chest, I even texted Joseph about it. And one of my good friends, I just had to give voice to my feelings. I'm going to get to it and I will see you in the video. Okay, y'all. So yes, I was a bit all in my feelings while I was putting this together over the last couple of days. But like I said, while we have that out of the way, I wanted to share with you why I thought it was important to share not only my career history over the last 17 years, but in particular, the details around my pay. Because I do truly believe that there is merit in eliminating the secrecy around what pay is. I hope to also encourage women to know a lot more about salaries, their ranges, and how to negotiate because quite frankly, I did not negotiate near enough in my career. And the gender pay gap is real. It is no secret that women are paid less than our male counterparts in the workforce. And specifically as a Latina, it was really kind of a punch in the gut to see that Latinas are paid 52 cents on the dollar compared to white males. It's also really important that we are transparent with you on our channel. And we're not gonna lie, increasing our income was a really big help when it came to accelerating our path towards financial independence. It didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of 15 plus years of hard work, but it was a really important part of our overall financial plan and the progress that we made. And lastly, if there's something that I can personally do to help other people understand what careers are out there and other examples of pay, then I hope to do a little of that today, maybe even a lot of that today, depending on what you think. And so be sure to stay till the end of the video because my last five to six years of history have a lot more detail in them because they were the more recent years in my overall life. I wasn't tracking tons of information in my early 20s. And I think you'll be really interested to understand how all of that was compounding together in terms of how I was able to overall increase my income by 10 times at least towards the end of my career. But first, if you're new to our channel, hi, my name is Stephanie and welcome to Permission to be Wealthy. My husband Joseph and I have open and honest conversations about what it's like to build wealth, to invest, and to pursue financial independence. We are a debt-free millionaire family of four now living in Portugal and designing our life on our terms. If any of that is of interest to you, and if you find value in today's video, please like and subscribe to our channel. We will be here on YouTube posting two to three videos a week this year. So let's go ahead and get into it. My first job out of college, I went to business school and graduated with a business degree in marketing, and I came out of business school thinking, okay, marketing degree, there's all these sales jobs and I didn't want a sales job. <laughs> so the job that I accepted after I interviewed through the business school was a job with a national jewelry chain. They had a merchandising training program that was about 14 weeks long. You went through this various training program in all of their different stores in their buying office. And after the 14 weeks, you got placed in a specific assistant buyer role in an office, whether you were buying silver, gold jewelry for a specific brand, you name it. I was eventually placed in the gold buying office and this job paid me $32,000 a year. I was taking home about $2,366 a month at that point. And so as we go through this, I'm going to lay out the role, the overall gross annual pay, the monthly pay that I took home in my paycheck. So that's post taxes. In most cases, it does not include commissions. It will include bonuses in some cases, specifically around the earlier parts of my career. But when I get into my director role and beyond, that is actually excluded. And I'll talk about that a little bit more and I'll walk you through the details. Okay. So that's the structure of the video today. So after I spent about a year in that role, um, that first job, I was learning a ton. I really enjoyed what I was doing, but the upward mobility at the company was 
very clearly made to me, not gonna happen anytime soon, anytime fast, and I was gonna have to work almost a decade to even get a buyer role in the office. And so I called the company that had also given me a job offer whenever I came out of college, and I started the interview process again, and this job was in sales, the role that I said I wasn't gonna take whenever I came out with my marketing degree. But I wanted to call this company back for two specific reasons. Number one, I was a very driven person. I loved to learn, and I knew that I was gonna bet on myself that I could make my career really happen as long as I put in some really good hard work. I networked appropriately, I learned, and all of those great things. The company that I was also interested in going back to was known for, through people that I had met in college that had also interned with them, for being a great company to work for. And these individuals were working across various parts of the organization at this large company, and I thought, well, I don't know exactly what I want to do with my life and my career, but I know I want somewhere where I can grow and potentially grow my career, select what I ultimately wanna do longer term with options. So I called this company back, I started the interview process, and a year later, I joined them in a sales role, an inside sales role. The base commission was $30,000, but overall, what I took, including base and overall commissions at the end of the year was $52,550. That was a 64% increase from the year prior, right? So while I took a base plus commission job, there was some risk there, but it really paid off. And monthly, I was taking away $2,131 minus commissions, right? So I was getting commissions, commission bonus checks quarterly that were on top of that monthly amount. So at this point in time, I was selling product well. I had gotten promoted through the queues throughout my first year. I was having different development conversations with different leaders, not only to get to know them, but to understand what all existed across the company in terms of career paths. And I was starting to have conversations about wanting to get into leadership. And I was asked to interview for a sales coaching position at the beginning of my third year, and then ultimately for a sales manager role in the middle of that third year. So I got both of those positions. The interesting thing about that time was I started to feel friction in the work environment for me. Comments like, oh, you can interview for this role, but you're not ready you're too young, or this is your interview to lose. And I'm not sure why I didn't let any of that really bother me. I think it was more so I was driven, I was focused, I was motivated, and this was all learning opportunity for me. So I accepted both the coaching role at the beginning of the year and the sales manager role towards the end of the year, and I walked away in my third year making $63,585. That was a 21% pay increase for my second year in my career. I was taking away home monthly $2,800. $21. And again, the commissions were separate. So I was still getting paid commissions as a sales effectiveness coach and a sales manager. And so those quarterly commissions were coming into my paycheck on top of that. Now, while all of this is happening, as I mentioned, I was having different one-on-one -on -one development conversations. And really in my heart of hearts, I didn't join this tech company to stay in sales, but through different one-on-one -on -one conversations, someone came to one of my direct managers in the sales organization and asked me to interview for a sales operations role. I knew Spanish. I understood process well, I was understood, understanding business acumen well at the time. And so I interviewed for that sales ops role, I got it. And when I moved into that role, I moved into it as a lateral. So not all job changes or role changes were promotions for me throughout my career. In some cases, I took some strategic laterals to get me to where I wanted to be with the expectation that there was some career progression behind that. So I was making $63,600 in the sales ops role as an advisor. I was taking home about $3,992 a month, which was a significant increase in terms of my monthly take home because I was no longer on a commission style pay. I was now a salaried employee. The other thing about moving into this non-sales role is it got me out of the queue and out of a funky schedule. It drove me nuts to be on this 12 to nine or eight to five or sometimes Saturdays, maybe Sundays, off Tuesday schedule. It was literally driving me crazy and it just wasn't the way that I wanted to design my life at that time or I still wouldn't want to design it that way now. And so getting out of the queue post 2008, it was refreshing for me to get away from a sales facing role because there was a lot of volatility in the sales org, especially after 2008. And this ultimately allowed me to move into an area where I could go flex my now process and international business exposure at the overall company. So I spent about two years in a sales ops advisor role 
getting to travel actually across the globe. I was helping to establish processes in Europe and APJ, things that were proven in the United States. We were transforming massive parts of the business at that point in time. And I was now being asked to take a sales operations role that was now again, customer facing. So getting to flex my old sales skill now in sales operations as what they called a customer engagement manager. And this sales ops role was a promotion. So I was able to land a sales operations senior advisor role. I was given a 20% pay increase for taking this role. And I was making $76,302 a year at this point. And I was taking home about $4,689 monthly. And so this is where things start to get a bit strategic for me. I knew through different conversations with my peers and other managers that when you got promoted into different grades at the company, there's an expectation that you are gonna stay in the role at a minimum for 18 months to maybe at max three years. And at that point, then they either want you to rotate to another role to gain other experience, or you should be groomed to get promoted and continue to go to the next level. So I knew that if I was in a senior advisor role in the sales ops organization, and then get to a consultant role in sales ops, I was going to have to stay another 18 months to potentially three years in sales operations all over again. I had already spent two years as an advisor in sales ops. I was now about to spend two years as a senior advisor in sales ops. And I knew that body of work already really well. I knew the organization really well, and I didn't feel as challenged. And so I went back to what I knew. I continued my one-on-ones. I started engaging my network again. And the interesting thing is, is the woman who had initially hired me into sales operations out of sales, four years prior was now in supply chain planning and she needed to fill a consultant graded role but now as a senior advisor. And the intention behind that was when they downgrade these roles after some attrition happens, they're gonna backfill them as a downgrade with the intention of promoting someone over time and keeping someone in that role for let's say three years, right? So she comes to me already knowing my skill set, already knowing who I am, already knowing the work and the development that I had continued to do over the last four years. She asks me if I'm interested in coming over as another lateral. So I would come over as a senior advisor, but I would move out of sales operations into supply chain planning, which within the company is kind of like a completely different company because it's a totally different senior set of leaders and overall organization. So I really had to decide if I wanted to leave the brand credibility I had already built in sales operations and move into supply chain planning. I ultimately took the job. And so I moved over into supply chain planning as a senior advisor over that time and making those changes in terms of those roles, I was given an increase in pay of 7% and I was now making $81,634 overall for the year. My monthly pay was about $4,960. And I was loving what I was doing in my new role. And I loved the leader that I was working for because she was really amazing to work for years prior. And so now I made it to the role that we were talking about, which was a consultant role in supply chain planning. I was still doing the same work, but just scaling up in a different way. And I was given a 23% pay increase. I was now making $100,000. $61 by that point and taking home about $5,950 a month. Now looking at that 23% pay increase as a consultant at that time and knowing what I know now as a leader, I was getting right size to the market. So when you start to get into these more senior roles, competition starts to become a factor whenever they're talking about talent development, retaining talent, etc. And whenever someone may not be paid at market, that person might be at risk for looking at another job opportunity and potentially leaving, right, for more pay. And so I was very fortunate to have a leader who not only advocated for me to come over into this role a year ago, but also continued to advocate for me to get promoted to the next level and also right size my pay. So now I'm in this consultant role. I'm scaling out my desk. I am starting to mentor other individuals. I'm starting to have more conversations about what is the next step after consultant, which is to get into leadership specifically in supply chain planning. I had been a leader before. I desired to be a leader in the future to continue to help and develop other people. And we had a new VP come into our organization. He was from the enterprise part of the business. We worked in the consumer part of the business. And he was looking for someone who was an individual contributor, senior enough in their role to know how processes and the organization and stakeholders work. And he was looking to fill two specific slots on his staff, a chief of staff role and a senior manager role for one of the more junior 
process oriented teams. And they asked me to interview for both of the roles. And I did thinking, you know, I'm going to interview for this. I'm going to get a senior manager role next step, you know, that type of thing. And he came back to me and he asked me really blunt. We had a lot of these blunt conversations, actually. He said, are you going to be heartbroken if you don't get the senior manager role? And I looked at him and I said, I don't think I'll be heartbroken, but I would like to understand what the rationale behind that would be. And he told me that that role, while I would be great and amazing at it, he didn't think it was going to challenge me enough. And waiting for a senior manager role that was the right role that was planned to come open within the next year might be a better fit, but the chief of staff role would not only allow me to get onto his staff, work with the peers as other leaders on staff, but also start to build my brand credibility outside of the organization. And so he saw this as a stepping stone to the right next senior manager role for me. Now you might be going, oh, take the next title, take the money, like, nah. But I really believed what this individual had to say. And I'm, I'm glad that I took his advice because I learned a ton working for him as a chief of staff. And he advocated for me significantly to get me to Singapore because of the work that he saw I did on his staff. And so nonetheless, two years after getting promoted to consultant, I took the chief of staff role. You'll note that this was a pay increase of 19%. So overall gross was $118,592. I was taking home in terms of monthly pay around $6,975. But because this was two years later, you'll have to note that one year I got a merit increase of 10%. Again, I think a talent retention play. And then I got another 9% raise to move over to the chief of staff role while I worked directly for my VP and then ultimately worked on a plan for my next step. So as a chief of staff, I was responsible for talent development across the organization, our organization management system. So how all of the leaders were responsible for different things in their organizations and how that all came together as a broader North America team. And I was ultimately responsible for interfacing with procurement and other stakeholders through our sales and operations planning process, which ultimately lands me into some other opportunities later on in my career. So while I'm in this chief of staff role, my leader and I are having this conversation in a one-on-one -on -one and he looks to me and says, so who's your successor? And this was like two or three months into the role. And this role was a very fast paced role. So while I was only in it for about 10 months, it felt like a really long time. But when he told me that, I kind of thought to myself, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not doing a great job and I need to find another, another role quickly. But what he told me was these chief of staff roles are really pivotal roles for people in their career. People get a lot of visibility in these roles and they tend to get poached for lack of a better term, or opportunities come very quickly. So we have to be prepared on who my backfill was gonna be. And nonetheless, 10 months later, a role on his staff as another senior manager role, specifically for their displays and client peripheral business opened up where I was asked to interview. I got promoted into the senior manager role at that point in time. I was given an 18% pay increase now getting paid about $140,236 a year gross and taking home $6,524 monthly. And so you may be looking at this monthly pay and be going, okay, this is very similar to what you're taking away home every month as a consultant. The thing that happens when you move into a managerial role, specifically at this company, is your bonus structure changes. So my bonus was no longer 10% of my pay. It's now 15% of my pay. So all of that math equated to me taking home monthly about the same amount, but bonuses were different as the year shook out. So this is where the strategy in career planning really starts to come to head for me. And a couple of things come up to me when I think about this. Number one, actively having conversations about your career and having active one-on-ones with not only your leader, but other leaders and peers around different parts of the organization are really important. The other thing is as you're planning for your career, whenever you take the next step, you should always be thinking about the second step behind that. And when I took this senior manager role, there was a lot of intention behind it. My manager knew that I wanted to be a director and a VP and beyond. He knew that I wanted to ultimately live abroad internationally and he actually gave me advice that that would be a good idea. He and his wife had done that. They'd actually had their kids abroad. He shared a lot of really awesome, helpful information when it came down to living abroad and growing your family, because that's ultimately what we did. But this senior manager role was not only just a senior manager role in its essence, 
but he gave me other responsibility globally to build my brand with another part of the business, in particular product group. And I was now tasked to manage the sales and operations planning process and to build a global process, even as a regional senior manager, but to build a global process specifically for this part of the business that was very important to our PL. That went well. The GM of that overall business really wanted some additional support. And he asked my chief supply chain officer and of course the leaders in my organization to staff a director role in Singapore where his organization was hosted so that we could work more closely, collaboratively, and ultimately create positive change for that part of the business because things were about to get pretty volatile. So in 2018, I was asked to move to Singapore. I was asked to take on a director position to scale out of my North America senior manager role and to create a team of overall global planners for this part of the business and continue to grow the sales and operations planning part of that overall business. And what you're gonna see that comes up here on the screen is my pay history from 2018 all the way to 2022, in particular because I did not get promoted after director during that time. And so I was receiving increases in merit to my base pay, but there was a big difference in what I was making in gross for a few reasons. Again, my bonus structure changes. So I go from a 15% bonus structure of my overall pay to 25%. I'm now getting paid restricted stock units. So I started getting awarded restricted stock units in 2018. They started to pay out in 2020. And so there's vesting schedules and all sorts of stuff associated to that. I'm gonna make another video about that in the future. And I was getting additional stipend pay for things like cost of goods, transportation, and utilities, which was beyond even the cost the company was covering because they were covering our housing. So as you look through this information, you can see that in 2018, I moved over to Singapore making base pay of $146,280. Over the course of those five years, merit increased is ranging from 4% all the way up to 10%, the last year being 6%. In 2022, I was making $189,561 in base pay, but you can see how my gross pay, so what I'm making overall, including bonuses, including RSUs, by the time I exit in 2022, I'm making $441,590 in overall that year. Of course, you have to take out taxes and all that other stuff, but that was a significant chunk of money. And specifically for 2022, I only worked at the company until April. So you can imagine if I had stayed the full year, I would have made in gross at least what I made in 2021 and potentially a little bit more. Now, if you watch some of our other videos or look at any of the other content that I've posted in the past on Women's Wealth Effect, you'll see that in some cases we were investing $17,000 a month in 2021 and in 2022. And so this monthly net pay that you see here contributed to our ability of being able to invest that level of money per month. Of course, Joseph's salary was coming into that entire equation. We are keeping our expenses low, but this is a big reason why getting intentional with your money, giving it purpose and investing that money so that you can unlock financial independence for yourself worked for us. And I hope that it works for you over time. So now that we've covered all the numbers, I wanted to cover a few quick points that I'll do more of a deep dive in other videos, but still I want to reiterate these items. Number one, negotiate your pay. If you're not negotiating, somebody else is negotiating and they are getting some portion of that overall pie potentially more than you're getting. Number two, own your career. I am a living testament of what it's like to actively manage and own your career. Have one-on-ones, let others know what you want to do, let them know what you don't necessarily desire to do, and think about your career progression, not only in just the next step, but what step comes after that. Have mentors, seek sponsorship. If I think back to the progress of my career, I know my name was being spoken in rooms that I had not yet been in. And I am really, really grateful to those individuals who advocated for me, who saw the hard work that I brought to the table and understood the potential that I was going to bring in the future. Be sure to educate yourself on all the different forms of compensation that are out there. Your 401k, your healthcare benefits, childcare, time off, relocation expenses, expat costs, you name it. There's tons of different things out there. So be sure to ask around, to ask HR, 
Do not take no for an answer when it comes to getting information about your benefits. And lastly, there are global roles out there and you'll be surprised, not very many people want to uproot their entire lives and move to another country. So if any of that is of interest to you, be sure to have some active conversations to see what's out there and go for them. I know that I have benefited whenever I hear other individuals and in particular women share with me their career paths, what they've been paid in the past, the struggles that they've had. But when we have open and honest conversations about career and pay, not only are we able to help ourselves, but we're able to help the collective whole overall in providing transparency around this taboo topic. Please let me know what you thought about today's discussion in the comments below. And if you liked today's video or found value in today's discussion, please like and subscribe to our channel. And remember, I hope this video gave me just a little bit more food for thought on how to give yourself permission to be wealthy.